Greetings, unsettled souls! <laughs> Sam might be the Ganji doing political commentary for the media speaks here, blasting news. I uh, also write for Teddy Stick, guys. It's the correct views. You know who it is. Welcome aboard. Um, if you'd like to donate, of course, while you hit subscribe and while you hit share, you can do so at the correct views at hotmail.com. You can do that through PayPal, friends. We're going to get right into it. A former UN ambassador power emerges as central figure in Obama unmasking investigation. Listen to this, friends. Former United Nations Ambassador Samantha Power's involvement in the unmasking of former Obama administration officials of sensitive security information is raising red flags over insiders view over what insiders excuse me view as an attempt by the former administration to undermine President Donald Trump and key figures of his team. Now, the reason I'm going after this is how many of you remember uh, what Sean Hannity said last week? That he was going to vigorously go after, uh, it would legally, anyone from the Obama administration who unmasked him. Well, I reported for Teddy Stick today that he's moved ahead with it. He's hired some of the biggest attorneys and most powerful attorneys in the entire political spectrum to represent him. It's over a lot of this that's mentioned right here. It says, power appears to be the central of efforts to top Obama administration officials to identify individuals named in classified intelligence community reports related to Trump and his presidential transition team. Basically, they did everything they could to sneak in and gather the names of people who they had no business acquiring the names of. Uh, Susan Rice, for instance, is uh, not allowed to unmask or gather data. She's only allowed to interpret the data that's given to her, and if a name isn't given, then she's not allowed to have that name, is the way that works. But that wasn't the law as uh, they chose to interpret it, as they were cheating. Unmasking is not a regular occurrence, absolutely not a weekly habit. It is rare, even at the National Security Council, and ought to be rarer still for the UN ambassador, according to the one former senior US official who spoke to the Washington Free Beacon. It might be defended when the communication in question relates directly to the UN business, for example, or an important Security Council vote explained in the formal official, who would only discuss the matter of a background. Sometimes it might be done out of other motives than national security, such as sheer curiosity or to defend a bureaucratic position, or just plain politics. Basically, you're knee-deep in illegality here. And the reason it stands out so much, especially right now, is because we're seeing the fallout of this from Pelosi and Schumer, Schumer people like that, who are dying to paint Donald Trump as someone who cheated with Russia, even though there doesn't seem to be any indication of that at all. There is no proof. There is no facts. There's been nothing offered up at all. As a matter of fact, there is a lot of questions that have to do as to whether or not it came from the DNC and how deeply it's tied into everything that went down with Seth Rich because we know that it wasn't a normal uh, robbery gone wrong. We know that because we've had forensics people document that it is not standard protocol what they have seen in the handling of this case. And these are some of the brightest minds in the field that are saying this. It's going to be interesting to see where this goes because we know that Seth Rich also was in uh, contact with WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. And uh, that matters because Julian Assange and WikiLeaks don't exactly have a habit of lying. Guys, this is from The Blaze and it's kind of creepy actually. Facebook shuts down AI robots after they begin speaking their own language. Now how many of you, uh, as you see fact cam over here, how many of you remember that there was a, sin a significant problem with this? when the robots were deciding at a uh, Twitter answer, question and answer session that the best thing they could do would be to kill the people. And of course they hurried up and shut down the AI. Well look at this. Social media Goliath Facebook shut down an experiment with artificial intelligence after two AI programs created and began to speak a language that only they knew. The Independent reported it on Tuesday. Facebook developers were attempting to get the two chatbots to barter a trade with one another, utilizing hats, balls, and books of varying values, according to The Independent. 
The two bots quickly resorted to speaking a variation of English between one another that seemed largely incomprehensible to the developers, but was seemingly understood by the two bots. Isn't that interesting? Now, some people would say that this is a glitch and they were able to read each other even though the words were incorrect, which could be a side effect of uh, bad programming or test programming. However, this could also be a sign that, given enough information, machines can create things even if they're not able yet to think of things. That's a very good way to put that, and I think that's what we're seeing here. The robots were reportedly told to improve the negotiation tactics as they bartered a trade, but were not required to use understandable English, and soon the bots began speaking abnormally. According to the Independent, a sample of the conversation went like this. Bob, I can eye everything else. Alice, balls have zero to me, to me, to me, to me, to me, too. Bob, you eye everything else. Alice, balls have a ball to ball, me, me, me. And it went back and forth for a while, and it said, according to the Independent, while the conversation originally looked like stuttering or glitching, the bots appeared to be using specific speech rules. For instance, both bots kept stressing their names, which was thought to be part of the bartering process. Developers reported that some of the negotiations carried out with this bizarre language were concluded successfully. They noted that the language was possibly just a shorthand form of English used by the programs to work more efficiently. So they may have been cutting words out, or they may have been substituting words for other meetings that they knew and were able to understand. And we're talking about created yeah, machines here, obviously. Things that were programmed by man. So this, this ability to adapt, if not outright learn, is both interesting and troubling, I think. Let me know what you think in the comment line about this. Uh, word of the day, robots. Uh, put it in the comment line. Let me know uh, where to send you some free stuff and I'll get it out to you. Word of the day, robots. Developers reported that some of the negotiations carried out with this bizarre language were concluded successfully. They noted that the language, uh, of course, Mark Lieberman, who called the chatbot's language facebotish, said that while facebotish seems like gibberish, it counts as a successful language if it's understood. He explained on his blog what it, what it, blog, what it means for something to be truly count as a language. He says, we have to start by admitting that it's not up to linguists to decide how the word language can be used, though linguists certainly have opinions and arguments about the nature of human languages and the boundaries that of natural class. Are vernacular languages really capital L languages rather than just imperfect approximations to elite languages? In other words, slang, uh, that, uh, uh, colloquialisms. All linguists would agree that they are. Are sign languages really languages, rather than just ways to minimize our mind to communicate? Again, everyone agrees that they are. While researchers were fascinated by the development and not worried about the language being a way for robots to keep secrets from developers, Facebook had to shut down the programs due to the fact that they were being designed to speak to humans, not encoded language. That's a good way to cover that up. Point is, they really didn't like what they found. Um, in the first place, it's entirely text-based. While human languages are all basically spoken or gestured, with the text being an artificial overlay, Lieberman wrote in his blog. Beyond that, it's unclear that this process yields a system that is kind of a word or kind of a phrase. Sentence structures characteristic of human language. Machines making their own language, talking to each other, to the point where they have to be shut down and we can't even tell exactly what it is they said to each other, except to see the outcome of the barter trade agreement that they had. Friends, i got two stories to get to. I do want to let you know here the Seacrest Motel that you are looking on behind me right there. That is where you are going to stay. And you're going to get a really good deal when you do because you're going to tell Vicky or her son, who owns the place, hey, I heard about this on the correct views. They said I'd get a discount. Guess what? You will. Tell them the long-haired guy sent you. And you're going to be staying at it. Look at that room. You're going to be staying there way cheaper than any of the other hotels in the Sandusky area. You're going to be saving even more above and beyond what Seacrest does because you mentioned the correct views. That's a win-win situation. 
to say the least. Friends, let me go on to the, one of the last two I've got here. Scientists discover a new fault line off the coast of Alaska could produce Fukushima-sized tsunamis. Now, I've been getting a lot of um, traffic on my Fukushima videos, so I've been adding um, more of the data that I get as I get it into the shows again like I used to, so make sure you let me know what you think of it. Every region is associated with at least one type of natural disaster. If you live in the Midwest, you have tornadoes to contend with, and in the South, you have to worry about hurricanes. Folks in New England have to worry about snowstorms, as do us in the Midwest. And people who live in the West need to consider earthquakes and forest fires. We take these for granted, uh, writes uh, shtfplan.com Max Slavo. We assume that certain places are in the path of specific disasters and immune to others. That, however, isn't the case when it comes to tsunamis, at least not for practical purposes. That's because the scientific community, it says, is still discovering new underwater fault lines that have the potential to cause devastating tsunamis. And if you live near the coastline, your home could be at risk of being swept away, and you wouldn't even know it. In fact, scientists have just discovered a new fault line off the coast of Alaska that could produce a tsunami that is the size of the wave that wrecked Fukushima. Now, we know that these tidal waves risk nuclear power plants. We know this for sure. And of course, they build nuclear power plants on fault lines to have access to water. And when something like this kicks in, of course, they have too much water, and then they have cancer instead. Uh, well, listen to some of this. Scientists probing under the seafloor off Alaska have found a, a geologic fault that they say signals significant risk of mega tsunamis in the future. The feature closely resembles one that produced the 2001 Tohoku tsunami off Japan. Of course, we talk about that all the time, which melted down three reactors, right? We can some argue four. While the Nature Geoscience, the team warned a large tsunami in the area would have devastating consequences to coastal communities. The discovery suggests this part of Alaska is particularly prone to tsunami generation, said study lead author Dr. Ann Bissell of Columbia University in New York. The possibility for such features are widespread and global in significance. The fault is roughly 600 miles off the coast of Anchorage, and according to one of the co-authors of the study, it could make a tsunami a lot more effective. However, this is hardly the first time that scientists have discovered a fault with devastating potential and the reasons that they weren't originally expecting to find it. The Cascadia subduction zone, of course, was another one. And it's capable of causing a 9.0 earthquake that would undoubtedly spawn a tsunami. And it said uh, the scientific community has completely unaware of this subduction zone until just a few decades ago because it will go centuries without produ producing any earthquakes at all. So... We need to take these things into account when we're putting um, nuclear power plants up, like Christmas decorations, because we don't even know what is immediately off the coast. And by immediately, I mean big enough to send a major tsunami in to wash this away. And I think it needs to be monitored and watched much more closely than it is, particularly until enough of us wake up and band together to get these nuclear power plants shut down. And that brings us, friends to the dumb deer of the day. That's right, the dumb deer of the day. I did promise you the dunce cap of the month show today, and uh, Christelle forgot to twist up the, uh, the dunce cap hat, so it's going to have to be in a day or so. But I do have the dumb deer of the day. It's from the Conservative Tribune, and it goes to President Trump for getting rid of Sean Spicer. Uh, I haven't got around to getting to this, but I, I think Spicy was much better than Huckabee is. Um, I think Katrina would have been better than both. But I don't agree with getting rid of Spicy. But check this out. He was a pretty good sport about the hate that he often got. Former White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer has a few words to say about Saturday Night Live. After the White House announced his resignation on Friday, and they were perfect. This, of course, is the date of the 22nd. Um... In an interview with Sean Hannity on The Hannity Show Friday night, Spicer addressed the late night show skits about him. I think that there were parts that were funny, but there's a lot of it that was over the line, Spicer said. It isn't funny. It was stupid or silly or malicious. Spicer acknowledged that he would crack up at some of the gats, but not always. 
There were some skits on late night television that I did crack up at, Spacey said. How could you not? They were really funny. And I don't even have cable, I just would catch it later. Well, so sometimes he said it can be funny. Some of the memes you have to crack up about, but sometimes it goes from funny to mean, and there's a difference when that happens. Mean is something the left and liberal comedians have plenty of experience with. He also added that a person needs to have a thick skin if he or she is going to carry out the job of a press secretary. And uh, here's a bit of the interview. I'm going to let it ride before we jump out here so you guys can see it. I like a good joke. I think when it's funny, it's funny. You gotta laugh at yourself and, and accept that there's some self Was Saturday Night things. Live funny? Did you like that or did that bother I, you? I think there are a couple parts of it that were funny, but there's a little bit, there's a lot of it that was over the line. It wasn't just, it wasn't funny. It was uh, stupid or silly or malicious. Uh, but there are some skits that I've seen on late night television that I had to crack up at. Uh, so sometimes it can be funny. Some of the memes you have to, have to, have to laugh at yourself a little bit. Uh, but there are times when it goes from funny to mean. Um, and, and that's that's there's a difference when that happens. Um, and again, to your right. point, yeah, you have to have a little bit of a thick skin if you're going to do this. It said, uh, <laughs> you can't be in the public. It said he was very generous with his remark, with he would probably want to vocalize for some time. And it says there's no doubt that comedians on Saturday Night Live have tried their best to rip Spicer and the president of every opportunity. A little bit more of this before we jump off. Uh, you can't be uh, taking on a role like that if you don't. I think it's hard. So have you thought a little bit about your future? Was this sudden for you, and you've been thinking about it for a while? I've always said that I was certainly at the pleasure of the president. Uh, of course, so, we all know, know that that he likes to, he's into the, uh, the reserves and all of that. You can check the rest of his out on the Conservative Tribune. Uh, and check out Spicer, uh, Saturday Night Live. He also told Hannity that he's looking forward to spending time with his family, who he sacrificed a lot for, of course, and he did not say... Uh, what time he would be watching late night comedy shows, but uh, we can guess. Good night, friends. God bless. Thank you for watching The Correct Views. Do me a favor and hit share and subscribe and let other people know that I'm out here. Please donate to the show, too, at the Correct Views on Hotmail.com. You can donate through PayPal, and all the money that you give to me, I put towards a better show, which is exactly what I want to give all of you. Good night, friends, and God bless.